one. Hey everyone, welcome to the HR McMillan Space Center. I'm Michael here in our ground station Canada theater, located on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. And welcome back to another edition of Ask an Astronomer. And as always, we have brought in our astronomer, and that is Rachel Wang, who is just upstairs. Uh, how's it going, Rachel? Pretty good, yeah. Upstairs floating in space. <laughs> <laughs> Upstairs floating in space. It's kind of strange that we've got more people now working back in the building, but we're all kind of like siloed. We're in our, we can kind of like overhear each other's voices in between the walls, uh, kind of like in between dimensions, maybe. Well, I'm not used to the face-to-face. -face. I'm used to communicating through emails. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, well, for this uh, edition of Ask an Astronomer, Rachel, we've got some fun stuff to get to. And of course, for everyone out there uh, watching on YouTube, or perhaps you're watching on Telus Optic, uh, you can put your questions in to the chat of the YouTube. Ask us anything, really. But we've got three or a really fun stories to get to. Uh, so if you have any questions about those, we'll answer those as they come up. And then, of course, we'll get to any and all of your questions, all questions in the universe. Uh, Rachel will attempt to answer most of them if they're space related, you know. <laughs> when we say the universe, that really means anything. So they could really ask you anything, Rachel, you know, like, what's the best condiment, you know? Ooh, mustard. <laughs> wow, <that's> surprising. <laughs> Very quick. <laughs> okay, weigh in on what all of your favorite condiment is in the chats. Uh, but let's get to um, some of our big space stories. Now, Rachel, last year we talked a lot about Venus because there were some discoveries or potential discoveries mm -hmm. that was made around Venus. And we wanted to, we needed more data, essentially. We needed uh, to know more about what was going on. And NASA kind of like put up their hand like, oh, hey, we actually have a spacecraft that might be flying by Venus. Maybe we might be able to take a picture and maybe get some more information. And you've got some information on that flyby. I sure do. Um, let me see if I can pull up an image of what uh, NASA's probe was able to take a picture of. So here is the picture that NASA's Parker Solar Probe, um, or PSP, took with its wide field imager called Whisper. And this is an image of Venus's nighttime side from just over 12,000 kilometers away. And this is in the visible light. And the PSP probe took this when it flew by um, July of last year. And so what you're seeing here, these streaks are likely from a combination of things like cosmic rays, the charged particles from the sun, space dust reflecting some sunlight, and also particles of material just coming off the spacecraft itself. So as PSP was flying by, it detected this really bright rim around here that you see, and we call this night glow. Now this glow is from light being emitted by oxygen atoms that are high, high in the atmosphere that recombine and then end up um, becoming molecules on the nighttime side. So we get this bright uh, kind of rim going around the planet. Now, the reason why this uh, image is exciting and not just a regular picture of Venus is because of this dark region in the center here. And this is the largest highland region on Venus's surface. And it looks dark because it has a temperature that's relatively lower than the uh, other parts of Venus. It's about 30 degrees lower um, here in the center. But Whisper is a visible light camera. So the fact that Whisper was able to pick up differences in thermal emission from Venus is kind of odd. And so uh, that kind of had scientists scratching their heads. So they went back and they're starting to run tests of sensitivity on the infrared capabilities of WHISPER being able to take um, or be able to see in the near infrared wavelength. So there are two outcomes that we could have. Either WHISPER can indeed have this extra capability and pick up these near infrared wavelengths of light. And then that means that researchers can take advantage of this and um, uh, look in the infrared when it's going near the sun and the inner solar system. And the other option is that it can't pick up these extra infrared wavelengths. And so these images that are showing surfaces uh, are showing the uh, features of Venus's surfaces tell us that there might just be a window in Venus's atmosphere that going all the way down to the surface if we're able to see through without looking in the infrared. So to follow up, the team has planned another set of observations. They did that in February of 20th, and um, they expect to receive and process that data for analysis by the end of next month, so in April. And so here is a digital rendition of what that Parker Solar Probe looks like. You can see some solar panels on the side here and a big sun shield in the center. Now, 
even though the focus of the Parker Solar Probe, as you can probably guess, is to study the sun, now Venus is a really big part of the mission. And the reason for that is because the spacecraft will actually do seven flybys around Venus over the course of its seven year mission. And it's using Venus as a gravity assist to launch it closer and closer and closer towards the sun as we're trying to get into the sun's corona. Now, eventually it'll fly as close to the sun as within Mercury's orbit. So really, really close. And it's going to be seven times closer than any spacecraft has gone before. So I'm really excited to see um, some further analysis, follow-up analysis on Venus and to see a little bit more about our sun. Oh, this is so cool. Uh, so I just, I just switched up my audio. You can still hear me okay, right, Rachel? Yep, I can awesome. hear you. So yeah, this is really neat because... Um, at the, especially these orbits as they go around the sun, uh, getting closer and closer and closer and using Venus to help out. And also they probably didn't really know that they would be observing Venus in this way. Uh, I find that really fascinating that they can just sort of like call out to their friends like, hey, anyone flying by Venus can like check us out, you know, if you're, if you're in the neighborhood. Let's make a quick stop. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So really, I mean, we've got a little bit more data about Venus and, you know, that uh, those readings that there was um, some phosphine in the atmosphere. What really is the next step? Like, obviously, they need more than just a flyby of a spacecraft. What would be like the next step to maybe um, getting some more um, hard evidence, maybe not hard evidence, but closer evidence to those discoveries? So definitely taking a closer look and with whisper and with it having this weird, maybe it's able to look in the infrared being able to penetrate penetrate through the atmosphere so we can study the surface. But if it can't, then knowing that there is some sort of gap, some sort of window um, in the visible light tells us a little bit more about how that atmosphere is distributed. And we're hoping that maybe we can have things like spectroscopy being able to tell us a little bit more about what is exactly in the atmosphere. Now, of course, the best thing would be to go and get a sample, um, but we have sent rovers to uh, Venus before the Venera seven mission was the one that made it down to the surface. And it was there for 35 minutes before it um, crash landed and melted. <laughs> so it is difficult to get samples directly from Venus. So the best we can do is uh, fly by with things like the Parker solar probe. Right. 35 minutes. So just a little bit longer than our ask an astronomer show uh, is how yes. long the before it got show. melted um, at temperatures like 450 degrees Celsius. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, okay, so more to come on Venus, uh, and of course, more to come on Parker Solar Probe as it gets yep. closer to the sun as well. Let's go further out into the solar system, and a new visitor uh, has uh, come upon us. Uh, let's say hello uh, to our new neighbor. Yeah, so astronomers found this roaming comet that has temporarily made a pit stop next to Jupiter among its family of captured asteroids, and those are Trojans. And these Trojans are asteroids that are co-orbiting um, uh, the sun alongside Jupiter. And this is the first time that a comet-like object that looks like this has been spotted near the Trojan population. And this unexpected visitor belongs to a special class of icy bodies, and those are called centaurs. And they're found within space between Jupiter and Neptune. And they're called centaurs because they show the characteristics of both asteroids and comets, much like the mythological creature does uh, show a mixture of horse and human. They're kind of similar. Makes sense that they named it that way. So these centers become active for the first time when they're heated as they approach the sun and they start becoming more and more comet-like as they transition. And so observations from Hubble showed signs of comet-like activity, things like it grew a tail, it's outgassing just of material and it's shrouding itself in a coma of dust and gases, all things that we expect to see from a comet. Now, earlier we had detections from the NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope and that gave us clues as to what this comet-like object was made out of. But only Hubble could detect these special comet-like features this far away at such high detail or high resolution. And it's also really interesting that this comet activity started really far away from the sun at around 750 million kilometers away, because we're expecting that water should remain frozen on a comet until it reaches about 300 million kilometers away from the sun. So it's quite far away that we're seeing um, what looks like is uh, melting of water. But because we saw um, some more data from Spitzer, we saw that maybe this outgassing material that we're seeing isn't actually water and it's actually maybe carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide gas, which doesn't need as much sunlight to heat it up and turn it from a frozen state to a gaseous state as water does. Now, this is a really rare event because this icy visitor would have had to come into the orbit at 
of Jupiter at just the right trajectory at just the right time and so on, so on and so forth to land in this special place to share that orbit with Jupiter. And so researchers are looking into exactly how um, it was captured by Jupiter and ended up among the Trojans. But by looking at computer simulations, it looked like the planet gravitationally kicked or punted the body toward a stable co-orbiting location in that family of Trojan asteroids. And these same simulations also predict that in about 500,000 years, there is a 90% chance it'll be ejected from the solar system and actually become the interstellar comet that it's trying to be. <laughs> oh, wow. So cool. Now, even just in that model that you're showing right now, Rachel, you know, there's been uh, some theories that suggest that Jupiter a has protected us from some of these um, these visitors that had come into our solar system. It is a very large planet that does tend to suck up these objects. But there is also theories that it also kind of perhaps bring more stuff in. So does it weigh each other out? Like it brings more stuff in, but then it also protects us as well. Yeah, so that was a very long-standing idea that Jupiter was this kind of, you know, cosmic broomstick or cosmic vacuum cleaner that's helping us vacuum up all these extra bits of dust and rock. But then semi-recently, there was the idea that they ran simulations of the early formation of our solar system and found that, well, maybe Jupiter isn't actually, uh, doesn't have an, enough gravitational pull or influence to be able to clean up all this dust as we're imagining that it does. And we have things like maybe Jupiter is making it a little bit worse, or maybe it's things like orbital resonances that are keeping things in line and it's not um, all Jupiter. So we don't really know if Jupiter is a friend or foe quite yet. <laughs> We, we have a complicated relationship with Jupiter, you know, <laughs> like, you know, he's kind of like he's outside in the playground and he's saying, like, don't worry, I'm going to protect you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's kind of, you know, like, you know, punching us in the arm and just being like, you know, I'm still bigger than you. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just like making sure that we know who Jupiter is. Right. Mm -hmm. Keep us in our place in our orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this is really great. Uh, you know, these words like centaurs, is really brings me back to my mythology. I hope people out there watching, uh, you're getting into your mythology. I just watched this show on Netflix um, called The Blood of Zeus, and there was a chimera uh, in it as well. So talking about like animals, uh, um, sort of like half animals, uh, really neat. If you don't know what a chimera is, Google it. It's really cool. Um, let's move on to our last uh, story before we open up to all of your questions on YouTube. And that is about humans potentially going out into space and potentially mm -hmm. going out to the moon. And mm -hmm. that potentially could be led by SpaceX and Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. And they did do some tests, yes. uh, but you've got some news about that mm -hmm. as well. And before we move on to that, actually, I think that uh, I wanted to bring up uh, going into space. There's a bunch of things in space, things like near Earth asteroids okay. that maybe um, are a little bit concerning. And this one is particularly interesting because it's probably the most famous, potentially hazardous asteroid known to date. And it was discovered in 2004, where it showed a really interesting orbit that brought it very close to our planet. And you might have heard about it on the news because people were really worried that it's going to strike Earth this month when it flew by last Friday on March 5th. But the asteroid by now is in range of telescopes and radar for orbital tracking, and scientists could rule out a potential impact from looking at some older astronomical images. And here is what its orbit looks like. And because its orbit takes a little bit shorter time than it does for the Earth to go around the sun, it is a frequent visitor in our airspace. And we're thinking that with new data, that it's projected to pass on Friday the 13th on April, 2029 at around 30,000 kilometers away from Earth's surface. Now this is a safe distance away, but it's close enough that the asteroid will come in between the Earth and our moon. And it's also within a distance that some spacecraft actually orbit the Earth. And it's also very rare that an asteroid of this size, it's almost um, 400 meters across, would be this close to Earth. And while I'm very confident that our tracking systems and trajectory calculations are all very accurate, um, there is something unsettling about the fact that it's going to approach on Friday the 13th in 2029. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, mark your calendars now <laughs> uh, because that could be, it could be interesting. Um, our first mm -hmm. question actually related back to kind of sure. like pulling in objects. That is, uh, thank you, Rachel, for bringing in uh, Apophis. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Keith asks, uh, could a planet capture an object that would become a new moon of that planet? You know, just as I was watching that sim the uh, trajectory simulation of Apophis, you know, it does sort of like come close to Earth. And you can imagine perhaps if Earth was bigger, you know, maybe it might capture Apophis so that it would orbit around it instead of the sun. For sure, yeah. So a lot of things in, um, I guess, orbital mechanics or celestial mechanics is just having the right velocity, being there at the right time, having the right gravitational pull and influence and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but with uh, capturing moons, we do have planets that do that. We have things like Jupiter and Saturn are able to do that because of their immense gravitational pull. We have our Earth um, pulling in our sun, keeping it there on kind of a gravitational leash in that way. So the gravitational influence does or is able to capture moons, but you do have to have um, these rocky moons not moving too quickly and also having the right amount of pull to keep them there. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Uh, let's just, let's take us back to the moon. looks like uh, you've got a wanted poster here. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to sign up. I don't know about you, Rachel, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, what do I need to do? So my, my roommate actually sent me this and he also asked me if I was going to sign up. And I said, not on the first mission, but on the second one, I will go and I'll tell you why. So Elon Musk has been planning the first civilian mission to send humans to the moon on SpaceX rockets, hopefully in 2023. And hopefully eventually after that, they'll go to Mars. Now, a Japanese entrepreneur purchased all the seats on this mission back in 2018. And then this month, he announced that he would take eight crew members from all around the world on an all expenses paid trip to the moon, which sounds fantastic. That's a wonderful vacation idea. If you do want to sign up, I put the link down at the bottom here. But this ticket to the moon is on board a SpaceX Starship rocket, which since December, the company has SpaceX has carried out three tests with Starship prototypes. Okay, but most recently they had the Starship uh, 10 or SN10 uh, test last week that managed to land as expected, but then suddenly exploded in a big ball of fire just a few minutes later. And this test went just as well as about uh, the SN9 tested and also the SN8, which also both um, exploded into huge fireballs. So this is the kind of rocket that you would be taking to the moon, which is why I would like to be on the second round. Um, and of course, in the face of adversity, Elon digs his heels in further and he says, Mars, here we come. This is right after the SN8 test um, blew up in a massive fireball. So I don't know if I'm going to go in the first one, but Mar uh, Michael, you're welcome to uh, input your name and let me know when you get to the moon. <laughs> Well, you do have to remember, Rachel, that the reason that Elon Musk, you know, has this uh, optimism is because each of these tests, they're just tests. You know, they, they did not expect to have people on them. And each one of them was essentially a success. Like they learned more and more about the uh, landing capabilities because these are re reusable rockets. And as you said, the last rocket that they just tested did land properly. There was just, you know, something else that went wrong. So the, they are improving and they are getting better and better. So, uh, you know, you, I optimists might think, you know, by the time that humans are going to be able to get onto these rockets that everything will be fine. And uh, when I'm on that rocket, uh, I can, I'll send you a postcard and I'll say, A-okay. <laughs> Perfect. But that's a good point though. These are all really small things that happened that caused the explosions. Like this one with the SN9, it went up perfectly fine. Everything was routine. And it just so happens that one of the engines just didn't turn back on. And that's why it exploded. And the same thing with this one, it landed perfectly. It just so happened that something went wrong on the launch pad and there you go. Right. I remember I was watching, I was actually watching uh, the live, uh, live tweets. This is what people do. I don't even watch it in real time. I just watch people tweet about it on Twitter <laughs> and somebody uh, tweeted just after it landed, uh, now blow up because that is the tradition of the SpaceX rocket. And then it did. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't actually become a real tradition for the SpaceX rocket. Oh gosh, no, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we do have more stories, but we only got about eight minutes, oh, sorry, 11 minutes left uh, before the end of uh, this show. So if you want to get in on any questions for Rachel, put them into the chat on the YouTube. Our first question comes in from Elizabeth. When something was caught exiting from a black hole, wouldn't that just be the other side of the black hole? Would we essentially been on the other dimensional side? So kind of like when I was on the other side of the wall hearing you do the school program this morning. 
Sure. So um, we know that nothing can come out of a black hole. Black holes are a one-way ticket, one direction, all the way to the center of the singularity. But there are ideas in science fiction, which also end up coming up in science theory, um, and hopefully eventually science fact, because that would be really cool, that you could have things like wormholes and things like um, leading into different maybe dimensions or different places in space time. So the idea that you might be thinking of, Elizabeth, is the idea of white holes, which is basically the exact opposite of a black hole, as you can imagine it would be. So a black hole, while it uh, takes everything in and you can only go towards the center, a white hole ejects everything out. So you can't actually enter a white hole. So the idea is that these hypothetical or theoretical white hole objects would be on the other side of a black hole. So you enter a black hole and then you pop out a white hole. So if that does go from science fiction to science fact, uh, that would be one way to travel the universe. Yeah, I guess the real tough thing about this is that I don't know if that's an answer we'll ever get, ever. Like, how would it be possible to test that? How would we be able to know for sure what's on the other side of a black hole? That's the thing that causes scientists um, to bang their heads against the wall, right? Because it's you can never test that. You can only come up with a theory that you think is the one that you uh, love the most. <laughs> right. Well, I guess the universe always has to keep us guessing, right? That's what uh, always draws us to it. Um, always more answer, always more questions than answers. Let's go back to a question, uh, which is a, probably a more uh, one of the more common questions you get, Rachel. Uh, one night, someone was in Stanley Park, a blue glowing luminescent light falls to the ground all the way to the ground. A meteorite, a satellite. What do you think? Walk us through sort of like the, yeah. your scientific method of trying to figure out what this is. Sure. So I would first look at um, if it does actually go to the ground and not just pass down to the horizon, because those are two different things. Um, one is based on perspective and one is actually landing on the ground. So if you do actually see um, something that's streaking through the sky, it looks like maybe a shooting star and it does go all the way to the ground, there is a good chance that it is a meteorite. And it would be something that is essentially a big chunk of rock that burned up through our atmosphere, was, but was big enough to survive that burning, survive all that material being shed and actually made it all the way down to the ground. And those are two kinds of um, meteorites that you can find. There's falls and there's fines. So falls are ones that you actually watched it go down and then you see where it lands and then you go and look for it and finds it just you stumble upon it and then you know that it's a meteorite based on some chemical sampling stuff like that so that's what i would base it on first interesting mm -hmm. uh have you ever found uh, anything on the ground that resembles a meteorite no but i've heard that um in the interior i think in saskatchewan i want to say or one of those provinces there are a lot of meteorites there so i'm kind of hoping that maybe i can go and maybe find one and bring it home <laughs> <laughs> uh that would be amazing you know mm -hmm. all, all i do is i just go to the store and I, I i buy one of the ones that they that they have in the display <laughs> shelf <laughs> <laughs> it's the safe way. Uh, let's yeah. go to some more questions. Um, white hole, is there any proof of such an entity in the universe? No. So the way that I like to explain white holes is essentially we have um, things that are, I'm going to call them space-time diagrams and just group them into this one thing. Um, but these diagrams tell us that uh, things like you can't travel faster than the speed of light and there's things like being kept in a causal light cone. So things that you can happen um, are within this sort of diagram within this boundary. And so what um, some physicists did is that they just drew the lines a little bit further. So they extended the lines on this diagram and said, hey, well, if this exists on one side, this black hole, then maybe the opposite thing can also exist as well. But of course, like you said, that we can't ever find out whether or not this is a true fact or if it's fiction, but it is a really cool mental exercise to think about, just like thinking about extra dimensions or multiverse. Right. Now, all of these theories, these concepts that you're talking about, Rachel, they all kind of like started uh, somewhere and, and they go all the way back to Einstein, right? And we just so happen to be celebrating uh, Mr. Einstein's birthday on Sunday, which also happens to be Pi Day, March 14th. Uh, so Rachel, uh, we're going to be joined by Jess McIver, uh, back from UBC, uh, who talked to us about gravitational waves uh, at our last Cosmic Night. But she's also a relativity expert, and we're going to be delving into Einstein's relativity on Sunday. So uh, black holes are, are part of that. What it give us like sort of like a primer of what relativity is and what we're going to hear from on Sunday? So um, there's special and general relativity. So Jess specializes in general relativity. And that is the whole idea that 
Um, it's this geometric theory. And I'm going to say that it's essentially Einstein's genius or Einstein's baby. I'm going to say <laughs> that he offered up and, um, there, the idea is that we can look at the universe in this geometric way instead. So instead of looking at things in the Newtonian way, where you have things like forces, you have the Newton's three laws of motion. This is how everything goes. We have, uh, Einstein and said, who said that, well, maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's this fabric of space time that is causing all of this. So things like gravity comes from the warpage or curvature of space time, things like where, um, light is going to travel the path of almost least resistance or geodesics is also told or get, um, given by what that geometry of space time is. So everything in our universe can be described in the context of this geometry. And you can almost say that it's, it's all relative to each other in that way, but yeah, so it's a really interesting way of looking at our universe. And I know that I'm going to bring up Richard Feynman because, of course, he is my academic crush. But he said that the day after Einstein came out with his general relativity paper, everyone understood what it meant. And that was just the genius is that this was a totally foreign idea, foreign way of coming at this problem. But it made so much sense that everyone just immediately understood. Amazing. Uh, so if you want to get in on that, uh, you can go to our website, spacecenter.ca. Uh, tickets are available for our evening event. It's going to be at 7 p.m. on Sunday, celebrating Pi Day. We're going to do some trivia. We're going to give away some prizes uh, as well. Hope to see you there. Okay, so we got a few more minutes. Uh, get your questions in. Uh, another question from Randy asks, I read an article that a theoretical warp drive that doesn't rely on negative energy has been designed. What do you think about theoretical warp drives, Rachel? There are many different designs. Um, I know that there is a grade six class listening in today that I brought up the idea of faster light travel. And that one I was talking about um, using, the, uh, using the curvature or being able to perturb space time to our advantage. And I brought up the analogy that um, it's almost like if our spaceship was a surfer, we could ride a wave and in that way have this sort of faster than I travel in the sense that we could have some sort of drive, some sort of way to perturb space time and then push us a little bit faster. But all of this is, you know, kind of contingent on the fact that we do figure out how to warp space time in that way. There's a lot of, you know, technicalities and engineering and some um, technical details we have to work out in theory, but there are, I will say that there are a lot of ideas from science fiction that do end up making their way to science fact. And I think that warp drives and being able to travel to other exoplanets, other exosystems will probably all come from ideas in science fiction. Yeah, amazing. Uh, speaking of that class that you were with, uh, who mm -hmm. might be watching, uh, shout out to, uh, what was the teacher's name? Uh, it was a class from Glenbrook, I believe. Glenbrook, we'll just say Glenbrook Elementary. Uh, were there some extra questions that you didn't get to answer uh, from that class that you want to get to now? Yes, there were. Uh, let's see. <laughs> there was uh, a bunch of questions about James Webb and the technicals, technical details of telescopes. So things like how does a telescope communicate um, with Earth? Um, we can think about uh, spacecraft like Voyager 1, Voyager 2, any of those that are traveling um, outside of our solar system or even within our solar system. They all communicate with NASA and other space agencies using the Deep Space Network or DSN. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're continually getting data um, from these faraway spacecraft um, as they're traveling. And the idea that uh, uh, how, how long does it take to build a telescope or spacecraft? How much money does it take? It... It depends. <laughs> um, and it depends on where you're saying it starts and ends. So you could say that it starts from the initial idea, the concept, or when you start actually building it. And so things like Hubble, um, the initial uh, cost or budget was half a billion dollars. It ended up being $10 billion by the end. The same thing is happening with JDST. It's many, many billions of dollars over budget and also taking much longer than we thought it would because the original um, conception of it was in 1997. Yes. And it was supposed to launch in 2007. So that gives you an idea of how slow <laughs> these things really go as they progress. Uh, and it's also the, the biggest and most ambitious telescope that we've ever sent into space. So you would imagine that it might be expensive and they might want to make sure that they get everything uh, right. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Miss Chen, uh, Glenbrook Middle School. I said elementary, you know, the kids still don't want to be younger than they are. They're <laughs> middle schoolers and they want me to not forget it. <laughs> uh, all right, Rachel, uh, we're just about at the end of our time, but a couple uh, rapid fire questions. Favorite pie? 
Oh, apple pie. Apple pie. Interesting. Yeah. Mine might yeah. be banana cream, maybe. I like I've never had pie. a banana cream pie. Mm. I'm not, yeah, it, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I haven't had one in a while. Uh, favorite thing about outer space? That it's so big. <laughs> <laughs> that's also some people's um, least favorite thing about yeah. outer space that's that's a very strange concept i think i wonder what the where the psychology of that is like why people mm. like you love space because it's just so immense and why some people are just terrified of it for the same reason you know, the answer to that is it's just so normalized for me just concepts and physics and astronomy are just i just accept them nowadays i'm like oh yeah of course yeah that could happen for sure <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I was to say my favorite thing, I really, uh, there's something I have to think about things that really like fire, you know, the synapses in my brain. And I think it has to be orbits. Like whenever you show orbits around things, I just get really geeked out and just like, oh, cool. I want to like get into the simulations of orbits. That would probably be the thing that I would have studied if I, if I went to school for it. So, and the fact uh, that we can simulate them so accurately that we can send things oh, so like cool. probes. There's lots, yeah. yeah, there's lots of games that you can play. I remember oh, yeah. there was a simulation game uh, when I went to the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now I paid full admission and I spent like two hours just on this one game. I didn't even go into the planetarium or see anything else and they were like oh, we're closing up and i'm like but i still want to play this game <laughs> you would probably like kerbal space program then which is yep. launching kerbal a rocket program. into space yeah i've also spent many hours on that <laughs> as well <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Ask an Astronomer. Uh, also, if you go to our website, we are open for some distant, for some small boutique experiences. You can come into the Space Center, walk around the gallery space. Uh, we're even launching some rockets. So you can build your own rocket. You can be your own SpaceX. Uh, all this month, uh, we're, we're doing that. So if you go to our website, you can book your time, uh, book your time slot with your friends or your family, and you can come on in and give us a visit and of course we will be back here on youtube in two weeks thursday at 2 p.m pacific time rachel until then see you, then. See you next time